empowerment through education, employment, and art. Meet one of the women making it happen today on Women Leading in Cannabis. Tell me, boy, you make me so bored. You need to walk the other way. I tell you once more. Welcome back to Women Leading in Cannabis, where we go deep and get real with the pioneering women shaping today's cannabis industry. You can find us on the PodConnects network on iTunes, Spotify, and Pandora. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Women Leading in Cannabis. I'm your host, Kira Reed, and I'm here today with Angela White of Success Centers. Welcome to the show, Angela. Thank you for having me. Angela is an Equity for Industry Program Manager at Success Centers. Angela's focus is developing sustainable career and entrepreneurial paths previously less accessible to communities impacted by inequality and the war on drugs. She offers community members career assessments and coaching, job placement, access to on-the-job training, and job training for employment in the cannabis industry. She also assists verified equity applicants in obtaining the critical business experience, educational resources, and tool sets required to develop sustainable business models and achieve entrepreneurial success. Angela's development and implementation of the Budding Industry Job Shop and Equity for Industry Workshop has forged the gold standard of equitable cannabis workforce and business development events. A graduate of Oaksternam University, Angela helped launch one of the first MMJ collectives in East Palo Alto and a dispensary in San Jose. Angela's firsthand knowledge of the many facets in day-to-day work performed at startups in the space, from cultivation and bud tending, retail design and staffing, to dispatching drivers and office management, forms the foundation of her mentorship with aspiring new employees, businesses, and equity entrepreneurs. Wow. Welcome to the show, Angela. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Oh my goodness, what a bio. (laughs) And I had to cut stuff out to keep it short. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I um, I am humbled by that wonderful um, introduction. And thank you for having me, like I said before. Well, we like to start with your story. So why don't you tell us how you found yourself in the cannabis industry particularly focused on community and equity? Well, um, you know, I have, uh, like you said, I started out helping to launch a uh, the first cannabis dispensary in uh, East Palo Alto during the medicinal era and um, d- did that for a while. And when I moved to um, San Francisco here at Success Centers, I had been speaking uh, with Liz on the phone uh, for about a year, and she wanted to launch a program uh, for um, jobs in the industry. And she wasn't familiar with how um, the cannabis industry worked. And so I came in and started looking at what programs we had existing here. And they did something called an employer spotlight for um, regular the other industries, right? It, it's a little bit different. I kept explaining to her, and I'd like to try something new. Instead of having one employer, I'd like to bring in uh, several of the employers because cannabis businesses weren't hiring on that kind of a level. You know, it would be, a, you know, a couple here, a couple there. Sometimes you get, you know, maybe 20 people they were looking for. And so I thought, you know, to bring uh, the employers in and have them sort of do like a TED Talk so that the job seekers could understand you know, what it was like to work in a dispensary. This was new. Uh, this was, you know, 2018 and just, you know, wanting to have, make sure that people had a good understanding of what it took. And uh, it the, the events just blew up. You know, people were, you know, coming in in droves. We were doing it in-house at that at time. And 
the lines would be out the door for folks to come in and be able to talk directly with dispensary owners, HR managers, and things of that nature. So yeah, that's how we started out. And what was your background before you became a part of Success Gun? Well, like I said, I had done, uh, you know, dispensary work in San Jose and, and um, uh, East Palo Alto, uh, but I'm a painter by trade. Yeah, I paint houses. <laughs> and so I always look uh, look at things as, let's fix this and make it better. You know, that's what painters do. And that's what I've been able to do with this program. So what is the mission and purpose of Success Centers? I know that you aren't 100% focused only on cannabis. Um, so tell us about, you know, the breadth of Success Centers and then how can women who are interested participate? Well, Success Centers has been around for uh, over 40 years. Uh, it started out working with uh, those uh, in uh, a juvenile detention uh, it was formulated by uh, some some some, joy, some superior court judges, and um, they were just trying to find ways to um, make these transitional youth uh, viable citizens in the market. And so um, they started out doing things like hospitality, um, and you know, just working in restaurants and things of that nature, right? And so um, Liz held a, a youth. Uh, group and they decided that they wanted to, you know, get have more jobs that were you know more interesting. And one of the kids said that they wanted to do something in cannabis, and everyone started laughing. And she was like, "Well, why are you laughing?" He said, "Oh, I, he just wants to get high," you know. <laughs> and so um, from that, she's like, "No, this is really something cool." So uh, Liz, uh, at the time, wrote a, a grant, uh, a proposal for a grant with the city, and they scored the highest numbers uh, with that grant for new for new budgeting um, business, but they didn't get funded. They didn't fund anyone, actually, uh, because they were too afraid to, to venture off into cannabis at the time. So she wanted to do that, um, and uh, when she called me, we talked, like I said, for about a year and I was just giving her ideas on things that she could do. And uh, one day she calls me out of the blue and she says, Angela, uh, I need you. And I said, okay, well, what do you need? She says, oh, I, I need you to come work for me. And I'm like, okay, well, well when do you want me to come? She said, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit my job and two days later I was at Success Centers and um, it's been a really, really nice journey. And is I've never heard of Success Centers and I'm, in the Central Valley. So I'm, you know, around the Bay Area. How do you get the word out about success centers? And does your target audience know that you're there? Yes, everyone knows we're here. Uh, like I said, we've been around for 40 years. When I, um, our events, okay, so we have like over 10,000 people that visit our websites. And then we are out in the streets. We have something called the Breaking Barrier Program, uh, where, you know, we, we actually are soldiers in the streets. We get out and talk to community. Um, we go to a lot of the um, uh, housing developments uh, that we also have space in where we can work with folks on job readiness training and giving them services uh, that we provide. Uh, we have a coding program. We have an early morning school academy where uh, folks are able to get their um, GED and dipl or diploma. Um, we have, like I said, the coding school, we have an arts program. Uh, you know, we, ha we do a lot with youth. We work with uh, traditional age youth through the YACE program. And so, um, you know, we're all over the place. Uh, we have, uh, what's called a pit stop program where we're bringing in, uh, marginalized folks to give them jobs. They're manning the street and sort of becoming ambassadors, uh, to the streets. They keep the, uh, the, the porta potty units uh, really nice. So we we're all we're success centers is everywhere in San Francisco and everyone knows about us. Yes. That is amazing. If women are interested in helping you in your mission and they want to volunteer to work with you, what, how do they find out more information? So you can always visit our website. I, um, for the, for the equity for industry program, which is what I do. We have a, uh, workshops that we do. We're always looking for folks to come in. We do a cannabis resume clinic. Uh, we need professionals to come in and work with our participants to get them ready to sell themselves on paper. We do mock interviews for them. 
So I'm always looking for volunteers to come in and do the, the resume clinics um, for the equity for industry workshops. We're covering new, every nuance there is for the, um, starting a business in the cannabis industry. And so, um, you know, I'm looking for folks to come in and walk people through whatever they the, whatever their specialty is. We've had uh, uh, understanding non-disclosure agreements, contracting um you know, uh, managing a cash only business, uh, how to launch a brand, marketing. I mean, we have covered it all. And uh, we do this because of the equity program here in San Francisco, uh, where folks who have been directly affected by the war on drugs can understand how the business acumen works for the cannabis industry and to uh, help them um, advance in this industry. That's amazing. I just admire your work so much. So you've been in California in the industry since the early days of Prop 215, otherwise known as the medical time. Um, and it, it's so you've been around for a very long time. Well, yeah, you're, you're aging me, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Not my intention. My intention was to show the breadth of your experience in the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I started uh having issues when I was a, a young mother, uh, I suffered with migraines and um, I was going back and forth to my doctor. This is how things started for me with cannabis and my love for the for the plant. And I, I had this black woman doctor and I kept going in to see her. And finally she says, Angela, she says, I've tried every medication on you and they all have side effects. She said, between me and you, and I can't tell you this, but off the record, go buy you a dime bag of weed. What? That's what she told me. <laughs> so, so that's what I said. I said, what? She said, it'll help you. And so that's what I did. You know, during that time, it was on the, the streets, you know. So I went up to the corner and told the guy I needed a dime bag. <laughs> Now that is dating yourself. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> you can't get that anymore. <laughs> and so, so I went home and uh, uh, you know tried it. Um, and all I I've done for many many years is uh, I'm been a, I call myself a one hitter quitter. When I get the signs of the migraine, I take a puff, hold it in, blow it out, and it's been about thirty years, and I have not had another migraine. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So this plant is is so special. She is incredible and uh, she is a healer and a unifier. And I, I just want to give her love and the way that she has loved on me to this community. That's an incredible passion. Um, and I love that because I hear that from a lot of women. They all have different stories, but ultimately the mother has touched them in such a deep way that they want to commit their lives to making sure that others have access. It's one of my favorite things about the cannabis industry and the people that work in it. But I've got a question for you. In working in this industry that you have so much passion for, what challenges have you faced as a woman and particularly a woman of color in your career in cannabis? Well, for me personally, I could remember when I, <laughs> when I first came on here, and I uh, had went to uh, an event because I wanted to get a feel for what the other uh, CBOs were doing for their, you know, job seekers and whatnot. And um, I, there were there were people who were um, over it. They, they've changed everything now. But anyway, so I went in and I went to ask questions to uh, some of the uh, there were two women that were talking about their company. And one, and one of the guys like, hey, hey, wait, this is not the time. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I can't ask questions <laughs> and just kind of feeling like I needed to maybe kind of like reinvent myself so that I could let people know that, you know, I do know something about this business. Um, and then the way that they were asking questions of job seekers, like um, the San Francisco has a 35 percent hiring rate. Right. And so they were asking people about their criminal background uh, in these meetings. They were asking them, has anyone ever been uh, evicted? They were asking all these questions. I'm like, well, wait a minute. We can't do this to our people. First of all, it's federally illegal. But they were what they were trying to do was find candidates that were that fit the criteria as an equity applicant. 
And I said, you don't ask those questions for people trying to get jobs. So I was kind of a thorn in people's side for a while. So yeah, that that was uh, kind of the experience. But all in all, uh, I think that because I'm a neutral entity, you know, I am working with uh, employers. I am working with job seekers. I'm working with the equity applicants and I'm just um, trying to make sure that there's fairness. So I think I get a well, I'm well received everywhere I go. That's great. I, I was just talking with someone on my team about you and letting them know I was going to do this interview. And she said, Angie's the best. You're so <laughs> lucky you get to talk to her. I, I think you are well received in the industry. So let's talk about your budding industry job shop and equity for industry. What is it? When is it? And how do women get involved? Okay. So our, our equity for industry workshops, we do those bi-monthly. We do them on the second Wednesday and, and fourth Wednesday of the month, uh, where we bring in, um, you know, like I said, folks to talk about the industry. And we have lots of women, uh, people of color, Black folks uh, that are coming in to give their expertise. Uh, and it, it's very helpful to have folks that look like you um, that have been successful. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Marie Momarquet, who manages eight different licenses. She and her brother have a farm out in Salinas. Uh, she does a lot of work with me. Jessica Strange, who is, uh, I will call her the cannabis compliance guru. Uh, she does a lot of volunteer work with me uh, to help, you know, guide folks uh, in the right direction. And then we do the budding industry job shop. That's on the third Wednesday of the month. You know, we'll have all the jobs that are listed and uh, employers that come in and, and work with us that way. Everyone that's interested in working in the industry uh, can reach out to me at, on our uh, website or by email and my email is awide at successcenters.org. Or you can give me a call at area code 415-549-7002. Okay, so you're spending a lot of time and energy working in the social equity space. And I, I'm asking all of my guests this question because... I don't think that we really have a strong vision for the future. I feel like we get into a lot of the fight, um, the fairness and making sure that everyone has access. But what is it all for? What is your vision for the cannabis industry if you get what you want? What is all of the, the budding industry and the, the equity for industry workshops? What is your life's work about? What is your vision? Well, you know... I just feel like we deserve to be here. Uh, we've been over incarcerated. We've had our homes uh, just destroyed, dismantled, uh, you know, kids put into foster care, uh, you know, just for doing uh, crimes of an economic nature. We've been redlined and we've been discriminated in banking. And so I just envision and I hope that, first of all, folks that are coming in from corporate companies, big companies that don't really understand uh, our conditions. I want them to be mindful that the reason why they're able to come in and make this money was off of the backs of my community. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a little bit of resentment. I, I kind of feel sometimes that they don't want to open those doors. And the doors need to be open. This is why the equity programs exist and they should remain. What I envision, if things were going to go my way, I see I walk in the store and first of all, you, you'd see black owners. I mean, I think we're like 1% of ownership in this industry, which is ridiculous. And the, and the reason why is the wealth disparity that uh, has been caused by the war on drugs. And so the equity program was designed to create generational wealth for folks in our community. And, and this, this subject is just like, it's, it's so hard to pinpoint in just, you know, a sitting session. I mean, there's so much that needs to be righted. <laughs> but what I would, would like to see is ownership. First and foremost, folks come, being able to go to work in this industry 
with livable wages, folks that are able to pass down wealth generationally because we know wealth passes down, not up. And so this is why I do the work that I do. And believe me, I'm jumping hurdles and and trying to create avenues and working with people that are like minded, because I think, you know, not everyone understands what the plight is of this community. But those that do, those are the people in my circle. I love it. I am 100 percent behind that vision. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, you have partnerships with Oaksterdam and the Hood Incubator. And one of the things that I love the most about this industry is the collaboration between companies. I myself also have uh, a collaboration with Oaksterdam and several other companies in the industry. So tell us about your collaborations. What works? What's been challenging? And what advice do you have for others about working together? Well, you know, I love Oaksterdam and I love Dale Sky Jones, who is the chancellor over there. You know, when I first went to to see Dale, I was uh, at an event. It was called uh, Stories from the Underground. And I got invited by one of her. Then this is when the uh, facility was open. Uh, you could go in person. Now everything's virtual. And so I go to this event and Libby Schaff is there telling stories about when she was a young um she was working for one of the um, politicians and uh, I think Jeff Jones was going against them, trying to get some legalization. He got into some trouble. And so as she's doing the research for uh, the person that was going against Jeff, uh, she started realizing how great the plant was. And so she, she started telling the story about how she was telling Jeff how to help him defend himself. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And so um, after the event was over, you know, I had gone with a colleague of mine here at Success Centers and I, I went I wanted to talk to Dale because when I was a young woman, I always wanted to go uh, to Oaksterdam, but we couldn't afford it. You know, and so I said, well, this is a place where people are coming from all around the world to go and learn about, you know, Ed Rosenthal's theory and growing cannabis and the business of cannabis. And so I waited. She was like, go, go, go. And I was like, no, it's not time yet. And so I do everything on feeling, heart, time, timing, and it usually works, you know. And so I saw her standing talking to a woman and I didn't know who she was at the moment. And so I walked up to them and I first introduced myself to uh, 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 Jeff and told him what it was that I was doing for the community. And he goes, you need to meet my wife. And so he's like, honey, honey, this is Angela from Success Centers. And so I started telling Dale and there was a, a, a female there with her what I was doing and how, you know, I needed to help this the equity applicants understand what they needed for business. And we were people that, you know, didn't have the money to for scholarships, you know, and I was hoping that we could work together. And she looked at uh, Nicole Howell, who she was standing there talking to, who's a great a cannabis attorney. And they looked at each other and they looked back at me and they looked at each other and they both said at the same time, you're the person we've been looking for. So from that from that meeting, Dale, uh, we gave out over 240 scholarships to the equity community. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I absolutely love Dale and Oaksterdam for doing that for our community. Yeah, the Oaksterdam is um, led by Dale is really so generous and their intention is to really elevate women and people of color into higher positions in the industry. And they are one of the organizations who is really kind of putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak. So we're very, very grateful for Oaksterdam. Do you have collaborations similarly with other organizations that you want to talk about? Yes. You know, um, I would say uh, Kaliva or the parent company, they have been working with us uh, to help with, we just launched, let me say this, we just launched an industry, uh, it's called Equity Pathways Industry Internship Program where we are giving folks uh, a $500 stipend to go through uh, 40 hours of uh, learning with us. And uh, we have uh, are partnering with Kaliva slash the parent company. uh, And they are coming in to do um, the history and cannabis or history and cannabis policy. Um, They're also providing the uh, dispensary one-on-one training where folks are learning everything in front of house and back of house. And then we're also partnering in that venture with 
metal who has a POS system. And so they come out uh, and they're learning that. They're also uh, being taught the um, cannabis uses and cannabis products by one of our uh, Oxidam alumni who worked, started out in the industry as a bud tender and worked its way up to being a buyer. And so uh, what this is doing is trying to raise uh, actually black employment in the industry because we're still being left behind. And once they finish with our uh, 40 hours of training, uh, they go into dispensary internships uh, where they earn $18 an hour, you know, to get paid while they uh, learn. And so, yes, I've had some really great partnerships with uh, folks in the industry. Akin Associates, Kevin Holler, who is a cannabis uh, compliance guru uh, on taxes and coming in and doing the 280 e-taxes so people can understand what that is. I mean, I've, I've, I've touched and been surrounded by such wonderful people in this industry that really care about this community. And uh, yeah, lots of partners. <laughs> I couldn't do it without them. So because you focus on hiring, I'm curious, as a business owner, do you have three pieces of advice for me on how I can make sure that my hiring practices are more diverse and that I am making sure that I am including people of color in the applicants that I am looking at? Is there something, a process that I can go through my company and evaluate what, how good of a job am I doing at actually being a diverse hiring manager? Well, if you sit down at your company table to do something and you look around the room and everyone sitting in there is a white male, <laughs> that's problematic. And so that's the first problem. And then, first of all, you need to have a diverse uh, group of hiring uh, HR people uh, that will, will look at a name. If, they, if a resume comes through like a, a Bernadette Janae or a Utopia Hammond. You know, those are not traditionally white names or a Kimura Wilson, you know, <laughs> uh, and and look at those resumes and pull them in because you might buy, you know, because a lot of times people look at those names on resumes. And I've heard this from uh, folks in the past, you know, that will say, well, if we've got a resume with a name like that. We just push it to the side. Well, you're, you what you're pushing to the side. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, that happens. And so just because of the name. And so if you. If you're if you're seeing a hiring manager that hasn't brought any people of color or any black folks in uh, for an interview, you need to check yourself that way. And then if I'm an employee at a company and I don't feel like there's enough diversity in the company, what are some actions I can take to help management change that? Well, you know, a lot of people are in these companies and that's in all industries. You know, there's a, a, set, a sense of fear. Uh, about speaking up because, you know, here in California, I'm sure, you know, the cost of living is. Yeah. And so a lot of times folks don't want to do that. So I have uh, with the folks that we place in these companies, they uh, I tell them that if you have a, a problem or if you feel like there's something that that's going on there that you want to share, come to me and I'll speak with the, the uh, hiring managers or, and, and people like that, because I'm not at risk of losing my job. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen, you know, women who have worked their way up in companies. And then when things get, you know, financially bad, uh, those are the first people to go <laughs> from the companies. And so here I then I start working, trying to help them get placed. So I'm not just placing entry level folks. I'm pr placing professionals as well. You know, uh, women are struggling in this industry and, uh, you know, it's got to get better. I mean, I mean, a actually, you're dealing with the female plant. So don't mess with Mother Nature. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> we are you are my first interview of the new year in 2022. What is it that you are most excited about in the cannabis industry this year? What am I most excited about? Well, you know, it's really kind of hard to say because the climate has been so topsy turvy. Um, you know, the bottom has kind of fallen out. You got farmers walking off, leaving their crops. You know, it's 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 really <laughs> it's shaky, shaky grounds right now. What I'm excited about, though, is because of I, I always look at try to look at the, 
the good side of things, because the pricing is down, there can be a, a, a rush for equity who want to launch the equity community who want to launch brands. Product cost is down, and so you're able to maneuver yourself and source get sourcing for this cannabis at a fair price. And as things gradually, you know, build up, uh, you may be able to slide into the market that way. Uh, we need we need shelf space. I'm hoping that, or looking forward to having more uh, black owned, minority owned brands uh, on the shelves and stores. So I'm. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Shelves, ownership, and those kind of things. Angela, I just love what you said. It gave me chills. Because of the lower cost of cannabis right now, which has been seen as a really detrimental thing to a lot of people in the industry, you have found a way to look at it as an opportunity. And I love that. It is an opportunity. So ladies out there, if you are thinking about starting a cannabis business, this may be a very good time for you to get involved. Thank you for that nugget, Angela. You're welcome. All right. Last question for you. What are you most excited about legalization and what are you most concerned about? Um, i excited about. Well, I know that as these, um, as, as legalization moves across the country, I would like to be excited about folks having equity programs first uh, before they start opening up the <laughs> uh, markets for uh, these multi-state operators. Keep it simple with mom and pops, giving these, uh, the community and people from the equity community, uh, a first fresh start, meaning the licenses will go to them first. That's what I'm looking forward to. What I would also like to say is there's been folks who have been taken advantage of as far as, you know, contracting and things of that nature. And so what I'd like to see more of are folks that have uh, put together like the working group who have come up with a, uh, a how to basically book on um, starting a business in cannabis. And it's really for it's really for jurisdictions uh, to look at programs and things that have gone wrong in equity programs uh, in other areas. And so that when they start doing their business um, or, or start opening up cannabis, that they will look at what they've, the, what they've found and try not to make the same mistakes, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, I was reading the other day um, that cannabis legalization is getting hung up in the Senate because of the Democrats' insistence on social equity. They need, they need to keep uh, uh, fighting for social equity. And you think it's important enough that we continue that fight instead of just getting in instead, and so we can get legalization? I do. I really do. Because once they open the gate, I, you can see it happening everywhere. Those folks are not going to look back and not want to, going to want to reach down and, 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 and help people rise up. So social equity must be there. It must be there. I agree with you. Well, thank you so much, Angela. It's really been a pleasure talking with you today. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you, Kira. I would love to have you come back again and share what you're doing. Oh, I would love to do that. I would, absolutely would. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Ladies, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't yet joined the Women Employed in Cannabis community, go to weicwomen.com. There you'll find all the details on membership for women working in cannabis. WEIC is a community that provides resources, connections, events, and content to women working in cannabis in the U.S., Canada, and around the world where there's an interest in cannabis legalization. We welcome women who are currently working in cannabis or curious about taking a leap in the industry. Consider becoming a WEIC member or WEIC business member for benefits and access across the network. And join us again for another conversation with women leading in cannabis. Mm -hmm.